Welcome back, everybody, to the Con Expo Con Egg Podcast, brought to you by our amazing friends over at Komatsu. Now, today, for everybody listening, I have a very important guest with me today. Everybody has been waiting to hear, they're like, hey, where's your dad? Where's your dad? Today, my friends, I am bringing on the man who created me, the man who uh, is my business partner, as well as my father and a very close friend. Um, so dad, I will refer to him as dad this whole time because out of respect, I never called my dad David or anything else. So when I say dad, I call my dad, dad, we say, we say that. So dad, thanks for being on. His name's David White, everybody. <laughs> well, thanks for having me on. Yeah. I think a lot of people want to hear, you know, about the business, about me coming into it but also maybe just like you know who you are and uh i thought that that would be really interesting starting at kind of like the beginning of it you know like humble beginnings you know um where were you kind of you know raised what was where when like you were born obviously in the 60s and you know the business was small at that point so speak on i would like to first off you know introduce yourself which I guess I already kind of did, but talk about the business earlier on and like growing up, I guess. Start from the beginning. I would, I'd like to get that story is what I'm trying to say. So I'm David White, resident owner uh, with uh, Ken White Construction and uh, started back, well, I was born in 65 and uh, 1965. And uh, uh my father, uh, originally he had started, he was, uh, delivering milk and stuff, uh, on a farm. And then, uh, they ended up moving into car to a farm house. And my father worked there doing some farming stuff. And then as he was doing the farming, he got into, uh, doing a little bit of construction stuff for other farmers, like, you know, working around their farms and stuff with, uh, with a track loader and a, and a small single axle truck. So, you know, then he had us, uh, the family and we all lived at the farm and, and he went and did the, uh, construction stuff on, uh, on us on the side actually, and then did the farming in the evenings. Um, and then, uh, yeah, like we went from, he went from there, uh, to then becoming full-time in the construction business. And, uh, he, he ran the business for many years without me. And I came along in about 1984, uh, out of school, uh, to start with him. And, uh, at first he didn't want me to come into the business. He just wanted, uh, he wanted me to go do something else. He said, the construction business is so, uh, up and down volatile that he, uh, he was trying to say, you know, go do something else. And I got to the point that it was like, either I was going to go work with him or I was going to become a competitor. So then my dad said, well, okay, come on, head over and let's see what we can do. And at that time he just had like, I think just a, a bulldozer and a, a, a truck. Um, and then we started doing that together, uh, in business. And he just was doing septic systems and grading around houses and stuff like that. Um, and, uh, so then as I started to get to know the business and learn it, um, I eventually, uh, became like a, a partner in the business and, uh, uh, started to go from there. I think it was, it was about, uh, uh, you know, 1999, roughly whenever I started to, to get, uh, pretty serious with everything in the business. And then in 2000, we got uh, busy with construction on the commercial end of it. That was the dot com era, and uh, I I started to to take over that end of the business with the, cons- uh, the commercial because my father at that point didn't want to have anything to do with commercial stuff. Um, so that was my first step, really stepping in and getting real serious with it, and and then I ended up buying the company from my father in two thousand one. Yeah. So then I just, uh, basically, you know, went from there. Dad passed away in 2000 and he passed away in 2001. 
I guess the ultimatum that you kind of gave of like, uh, I'm either going to work with you or work against you, I guess was like, like, you know, obviously was that a bluff or were you serious? Uh, I was serious because that's what I want to do. Uh, I don't, I liked the construction business. It was, uh, it's interesting to me. I enjoyed running the machinery and, uh, watching my father, what he did throughout the years, it just, it, it interested me. And I knew I wanted to do the stuff outside because in my prior to, to that, I, I was always doing part-time jobs in a construction business, like between washing trucks, running scales, uh, being in loaders out at, out at another company. Uh, so I knew that's what I wanted to do. So it was either that, or like I said, I was going to become a competitor. So you, you grew up just having a love for construction, obviously. Now, how do you go from like, when you, you know, bought the business and, and grandpa died in 2001, what was the state of the business then? Because I, I'm, I'm always interested in like, I want, I think the most interesting part is going from where you were in 2001 to where you're sitting right now in our new offices and stuff. So, but let's 2001, like what was the business like when you officially owned it, you took over, grandpa's no longer here? Well, 2001, the business was doing quite well because that was uh, during the dot-com era. Um, so we were really busy doing commercial work uh, at that point. And that was our, my first real step of getting into the, uh, the con commercial world. Uh, so it was, it, was, uh, it was good. What kind of commercial stuff? How did you come into that commercial stuff? Was it a single client that was like, hey, like we want some more work and here's some opportunity to expand? How many people worked for you at that time? And was it like a single job that gave you the opportunity to kind of expand larger? We had about, I'd say I had seven people, six people at that time. And I ended up having to sub a lot of stuff out for the commercial project that we got involved in. And I got involved in uh, building uh, parking lots, excavating on for buildings. There was one site that had like four different buildings that we had to dig and build uh, parking lots in. And then we had to do the sewer, uh, or not the sewer, but the water portion of it to, to the site. So I ended up subbing that portion out. So. Uh, that's how I kind of got into the, the bigger commercial stuff. And that was one client that kept me busy. That's all I could do. And it took, what it ended up doing to me is it took me out of the residential business for about a year and a half. Uh, and then what I learned was that wasn't a good thing because after I got caught up in the dot-com era with the commercial and died down, I had to go back then to the residential. And the residential, I took myself out of, and it took me probably six months before people realized that I keep am back to do residential. So that's one mistake that I made. I should have, I should have done both at the same time. We talk about that a lot, um, like not putting all our eggs in one basket. And as far as, you know, like when we have meetings here and I'm speaking to the audience right now, uh, when we have meetings on our team, you know, like me and dad will sit down and have a scotch and talk. And, you know, we're always happy and proud that we're not turning our backs on on residential ever, you know, um, because residential is the, the cash flow to growing on commercial sides. And at the end of the day, I think we could both agree, though, too, dad, that like residential, it kind of gives you like it's it's a very business to consumer end of it which, you know, commercial, you know, there's ladders and you got to talk to this person, this person. And I think one reason why we love is like, we're a family business and we're helping other families kind of like build their homes. And so that's another aspect of the residential that's awesome as well too. But great testament to like, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Cause like you said, you learned a super valuable lesson by putting all your eggs into commercial. And then when that kind of was over going, oh crap, there's nothing left in uh, there's nothing left now. So I need to go back into residential as well. But I'm interested with that job because I always kind of, you know, like I'm a big risk taker. I like taking risk. Um, what about that project? Like, I'm surprised that you actually did that because you take risks, obviously you're in business a lot, but you're kind of more on the conservative side of 
of risk taking. And to me, it sounds like when that, you know, big commercial developer came after you to do this work kind of sounds like you bit off more than you could chew as far as, oh, I had to get subcontractors and there's water. Um, so like, what was kind of the intentions of that? Like, did you want to execute it or was it like, you know, grandpa just, you know, passed away and I know I got to do this or what was it? No, that started like my commercial stuff started in about two in 2000. So that's how Ken White construction. So grandpa was still alive. Yeah. He was sick at the time, but he just didn't want to, you know, start something new in the commercial end. So I said, well, I'll open up another division. Uh, and run the commercial out of Ken White Construction 2000. And that's what we did. The opportunity was there for me not to take it. I knew the project manager. I knew the uh, CEO at the uh, company that we were working for. So my comfort as far as getting paid and doing the work was good. I just had to make sure that I could follow through and get the work done. Uh, and be able to do it what they wanted. And I, and I did, like, I just, uh, like I said, we just subbed out stuff and I oversaw a, a bunch of it that I didn't have machinery for. So it worked out well. Like that, that project, I remember like that kind of, that kind of really helped you put us and Kenway construction kind of on a, a different level. Like I remember, you know, and maybe this is kind of going back in the story a bit too, but you know, contrary to what everybody might believe, you know, like money was always, you know, super tight when we were growing up. And then I remember, you know, you started growing the business on the commercial side. And I mean, not that we were flying around in private jets and helicopters, but, you know, life was getting, we were moved from, you know, lower middle class to upper middle class, you know, got a nice house in a suburban, um, you know, called the sack and uh, life kind of changed after that. Like, did you feel the effects of that? Like, like that must've been, a good feeling for you. I mean, you had two young kids and, you know, you're doing well in business. I mean, other than, you know, losing your father, which is a big thing, you know, I feel like that was kind of like a pivotal moment for the business and like for your life personally as well. No. Oh yeah. It, it was a, it was a big boost to, uh, the business and for our, our life financially, just because it was such a great job for us. Um, so it, it opened my eyes on, you know, how everything uh, could be, you know, created down the road. And, and so it worked out really good for us to do that. I think it's actually interesting. And I, I mean, I, for the listeners listening, you know, my dad is on one end of the spectrum of kind of like, we don't talk about, you know, this sort of stuff and I'm more of an open book, but like, I think it's really awesome for the viewers to hear as well too, though, dad, that like, I, you know, you share stories with me, like you remember when the repo man was coming to get your pickup truck because you couldn't make the payments on it. And you're trying to negotiate with him and say, hey, man, like, don't take my truck. Like, speak about those times as well, too, because you're sitting in this nice, beautiful black, you know, office right now in this building that we have. And although it takes a lot to get to where we are, like, I think it's also important to highlight where we were and where you were. Yeah, it goes back. Well, I probably 31 years today, uh, to when my wife and I got married and we built a house, uh, just outside of carp. And that's whenever everything kind of went, the economy actually started to die off just after we had gotten married. And at that time, um, uh, Diane, my wife, she was, she had a hairdressing business that she was running and it, uh, we didn't have any construction work. And like you say, like there was, uh, people calling, wondering, you know, you're going to make a payment on your truck and then the machinery and stuff that we had, we owed money on. And I just got to the point. It's like, you know what? I'm not hiding. So I didn't hide from them. I talked to them and I said, here's the situation. I don't have the money to pay for those, uh, the truck payment. Where do you want the vehicle? And we could go from there. And basically the finance people worked with us. Um, uh, they, they, it was like cat and GM, like they were very good with us and said, no, we'll just extend it. And then, uh, my wife ended up, uh, working and keeping, you know, the household stuff going as we were going through things. So she's as much of a partner to me going through all this stuff, uh, you know, uh, to get us to where we are today through the bad times, you know, it's a family thing. And yeah, full, full team effort. Like I remember growing up and 
you know, mom was working 14 hour days, uh, cutting hair. We had a mom ran her business out of our house and like, yeah, like it was, you guys were both just constantly out there working, but it always interests me. Like when you had like no work, like what was your strategy to find and attract new work when in a time the economy's gone to, you know, kind of sh and you know, you have payments coming out that you can't afford. What do you do when your back's up against the wall? Grind. That's all I could do. Like I basically just talked to people. I did whatever I had to do. Uh, I was going to go get a job at a big construction company that was in the area. Uh, but, and they, they would hire me, but there was no work for them neither. They were, they had enough just to keep their own going. Um, so I didn't really have much of a choice to go do anything other than, you know, we had the machinery. I just needed the opportunity to be able to go out and make some money. And, uh, it was just time. Like I couldn't create the work for people to hire me. It was just, we had to just put out the time and get through it. And, uh, we did. And, and the phone started to ring again. And then we got uh, back, uh, back, back to work. We had to make some adjustments and stuff. So I just think though, that like, that's such an important thing for people to hear. And even myself, when I listen to that, because like, there's so much value in that for people that are listening right now, like you went through a time where there was no work, you had, you know, people calling saying, Hey, make your payments. You know, your wife's working 14 hours a day to keep the house going multiple mortgages on the house just to, to make it go. And like, but yet like the way you said it at the end part, you know, like, Oh, eventually the phone, you know, rang again. And it's like, you need that outlook of like, yes, there's, we're going to go through some times right now, but things will eventually get better. You know, like it's insane. Like, I mean, it's just crazy how it's just kind of, you snowball over that, but it's pretty surreal. Yeah. Well, you don't have a whole lot of choice. Like, that's the thing. You can beat yourself up all you want. But that's not going to change the fact that there's no work and you're, you're just scraping by. So, you know, you got to just be able to, like, the construction business, as you know, is so up and down. And it takes a special person to be able to be in the business and have the mindset to get through the tough times. Because it's, it's just, it plays with your mind on the ups and downs in the economy. Um, you know, it goes for other businesses too, I'm sure, but, uh, you gotta be a special person to be able to stay in the construction business. Yeah. And like, what do you like the opposite, you know, kind of now, like, do you think that that's, that is an important lesson to learn? Like, obviously we're still, we're both kind of like construction and, you know, you don't wish of a downturn or stuff happening, but like, do you think it would be beneficial for someone my age as a millennial who like I couldn't own a business and when the recession came in 2008, but like, do you think that it hinders my success and would change my business mindset if I went through or viewers listening right now that haven't gone through bad times versus such as someone such as yourself that has gone through bad times? You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, I, I think going through bad times, is a, it's, a, it's a good business lesson. Nobody can teach you anything because back at the time, uh, we were buying a lot of machinery all at once. Uh, my father, you know, as biz we got busier, he just would say, okay, let's just go buy another dozer, buy another track loader, buy. And then I, I was always like, oh, but what if dad, what if, and my father never really worried about the what ifs. Um, and then when the what if did come and the recession hit. That's whenever it was like, okay, this is an eye opener. Like, you know, economy can crash and it will again. Like it's just history. That's what happens. Uh, but you just got to set yourself up better for that. And that's what I learned. I learned to look not 10 years down the road. I looked at three to four years down the road. And then as we started to go and grow and buy machinery, uh, as the machinery got paid off, I tried to look, you know, I know three years down the road, I'll have, you know, that machine paid for and the other machines can help get paid for it. So that's what, uh, you know, going through a tough time taught me was just don't go 
too crazy and to extend yourself out too much at a long distance. Because if you can manage that, you can pretty well get through any recession because you can set it out. And, and you know, sure, you're going to maybe have to downsize with some of your employees, but you've got your machinery with a pretty, you know, that's all paid for. So you'll be in pretty good shape. Yeah, I think that it's important, you know, what you said, like grandpa was kind of, you know, let's go and let's buy this and didn't think about the what if and you kind of did listen to and think about the what if. And I think that's actually what also makes a good team as well, too, though, like us now, like I'm very I don't think about the what if and you think about the what if. And maybe my perspective on that would change if I did go through those bad times. But I also think that it's a healthy relationship to have in business because you need somebody that's constantly driving for more. Let's go. Let's push. Not to say that you aren't. You are 100 percent. But you have more of a hold back of like, what if? Which is, I think, important. So speaking on a team dynamic, I think that it's important to have that. No. Yeah, it is. And I think you had a bit of a what if with the COVID. So when COVID hit in 2019, we had a what if moment, like, because yeah, like we didn't know what was going to happen. Sending the dump truck back. We're like, what are we doing? Holding off on it. Yeah. We had new dump truck ordered. Uh, and then I, yeah, and, and then I got calling and I'm like, oh my, like, what are we going to do? Uh, and you were, you were, and I were talking and you were like, dad, like, like, what's it going to be like? Like, how long can we go before, you know, we have to really start to worry. And, uh, I worked numbers. I looked at things. I made phone calls to the finance people because anyone I talked to, like going through a recession, there's always somebody that you can talk to and say, what happens now? Like, give me some direction. Uh, when we hit that COVID era, I t- reached out to my mentors, talked to people that had been in business for a long time. Nobody could give me the answer of what to expect next. Because nobody had it. That's right. And it was a scary time. So that experience alone going through, it, you seen how all of a sudden something could come and stop, right? Real quick. So it kind of wakes you up a little bit too, going, okay. It's, it's not a never ending, you know, you know, butterflies and stuff, uh, you know, you know rainbows, like it's, it, you're going to hit some hiccups in life, uh, and you've got to adjust on the fly. And, uh, you know, I, I think with, with you guys, you, you, have, you haven't seen a recession as of yet, uh, anything big, uh, that's, that's really hurt, uh, but it will come and I can't teach that to you and I can't teach that to a, uh, any other business person, but I can give you my experience on something. And that's what, when we hit that COVID uh, era, there was no one that you could talk to, to figure it out, which kind of, which kind of was strange thing too, because even with the banks and with the finance people for the equipment, they didn't know what was going to happen. And nobody was willing, nobody was, it was out of our control and it was, it worked out really well, you know? as far as business wise. Yeah. I almost think it was like not a good lesson at all, to be honest with you, because I was so scared of losing everything that we've been working so hard for and, you know, grandpa and you, and then it turned around to be the most impressive three years of business ever for anybody. You could have went and bought an excavator and kept it busy for the past three years. Like no problem, which is insane. It was a very short window whenever the 2019 COVID happened, right? Like we were like, what, two, three months, like everything went to a standstill. And then it was, it, it was like, okay, full cylinders. Let's keep that truck coming, keep everything going. But it was a, a short window for you to see how something could change quickly. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that's in the past now. And, uh, yeah. So today, what is the business like today? And you know, kind of interested in talking about the dynamic that we have here now and like, you know, your role and what you're doing and what you think of the business, like what, in in your opinion, you know, like how's Ken White Construction doing? 
Like I never ask you that ever. How is it doing? Okay, let me back up a l- just a little bit. Don't talk about the pandemic again. No, you talk, <laughs> you're asking about how the business is doing. Well, whenever I was got into the business to to do it, I was I was an operator. I wasn't a a, a businessman. Uh, I was an operator, go out, did the work on site, did everything that I did, speed it up to like whenever you started at 2018 with us uh, in the business and you became partners in the business, uh, the whole dynamics changed because now as a business person, I got pushed out of the machinery as we grew, as we grow and you become a business person in the office now. And my dynamics in the office is I'm overseeing the the, the financial day to day stuff. Uh, it took me away from now that we don't now that we got people hired for estimating, project management, project supervising. Uh, it's it's a different mindset for me in business to to sit where I'm sitting today, but I'm enjoying it because I'm seeing you guys grow in the business and the business has changed so much, uh, because of the, the, the internet, uh, stuff that you can do with the, uh, Instagram and YouTube and stuff like that, that you're breached. And it, we've got the exposure now that I could never have had, uh, prior to that. Did you ever see kind of like construction getting to where it is today? Like with just you? No. Definitely not. I was, I felt like I was stuck on a little island actually. But did you have any interest in growing it to where it is now? I I probably, I would have grown the business, but not to what it is today because I didn't have the people that I was comfortable enough with to do that. Uh, It's great to have uh, you in the business, my nephew and my two nephews in the business. Uh, So family being in the business, it was much easier now to move forward and see it grow. There was an end for me because if it was not family that was going to be coming into the business, I would not be doing what we're doing now because, uh, but you get to a point in your life, it's like, you know, how much stress do you want to put yourself through to try to do it? And then what's your end goal? So to get out. So that's like, I'm, I like where it's headed now because, uh, you guys are involved in the business and it's, it's growing and it's fun to see. I guess it's pretty different. I mean, cause if you go back to, you know, 1960, you know, when you were born and there's no cell phones or anything like that, you know, technology is way further behind then than it is now. And now you have a business where you have a videographer on payroll that follows me around and follows the guys around and we upload content to youtube and instagram and like what is your thought on that uh i didn't know what to think whenever you yeah better rephrase that what was your initial thought on me doing that rather than people always ask me that question what does your dad think what did he think i'm asking you what did you think when i was like hey i want to start putting stuff online and YouTubing our life. Honestly, like at that time, I remember you saying to me, you wanted to go on Instagram and do this stuff. I didn't even know what Instagram was. You still don't. Uh, I, I follow the stuff. That's about it. <laughs> but you know, I, I didn't know what it was. And I'm thinking, okay, after you told me about it, like I wanted to stand behind you and see what can he do? Maybe he knows something. I don't know. That's impossible. He, he couldn't know something. I don't know. Right. Well, yeah, you proved me wrong. So, yeah, you know, so that's what I, I didn't know what to expect actually. And then I just put my trust in you and, uh, what, what you can't learn something that you don't know. And I didn't know anything about the, uh, the space that you were heading to for Instagram and YouTube and everything. Do you think that a business or somebody listening right now that has a business from, you know, somebody such as yourself, an older gentleman, and let's say another older gentleman's listening, um, what advice, like some of your old business buddies, you know, that like, 
do they ever talk about YouTube or talk about the, you know, social media that we have? And what's your response to them? Like, you, you guys need to do this or uh, I don't really know. Like, like, what do you think it does for a business? Well, I remember whenever you start, you were starting it and they were talking to me going, what's he doing? Like, holy jeez, what's that costing you? And I said, well, you know what? I don't know much about it. But my son told me, you watch, Dad, in four years, they're going to be trying to catch up to us. And I didn't know what that meant. I'm catch up to what? Um, so now, fast forward to today, and now the people that were asking the questions and thinking, you know, what are you doing? Uh, the business guys, they are trying to catch up. And they're following you and they're, they're telling me about the stuff that you're posting. So they've done a complete, you know, turnaround on what, it, what the internet can do. Um, so I say like, yeah, like you got to get on it in order to, if you want to grow the way that we're growing and the exposure that we're getting, the doors that it opens for us is it's amazing. Like I, I didn't think that it would be what it is today from what you had uh, created. So hats off to you. Yeah. Um, I think it's, yeah, it's pretty neat. And I also think like, I remember when, you know, we were talking about it and you kind of didn't have any idea what was going to happen from it. And we ended up making something of that, which I think is, you know, really unique and pretty unreal. But I want to talk also about, you know, the building that we have now and kind of get a summary, I guess, of where the business is right now and what you kind of see, like, what are your thoughts on the entire business? Not just social media, not just yourself, not just me, not just whoever, but like the business itself, like what it would be a good summary of Ken White Construction as of today. A great family run business. Um, I, I think we're setting it up for future generations and that's the whole goal, uh, in, in the business for me. Um, I think that if, if to be able to have what we have by, you know, a, a building, get things set up with the company now has its garage offices, uh, it's more corporate set up, uh, that we've given it room for the future generations now to grow. Cause like whenever I started, it was just a little shack we were in, in the middle of like our yard and car. Um, today, you know, moving forward, you got to, we now we have a, a, a nice piece of property with the building, uh, that can be for the future generation again. So, you know, I, I think we're headed in the right direction for sure. Uh, and it's about the family in the future. I would have the exact same answer. I also would just add that, like, I really enjoy seeing our employees and seeing them grow with the company as well, too. I think all like, I mean, your grandfather now you're thinking of, you know, my kids and, you know, my, Lisa's kids, my sister, um, when you say like generational, but I very much also like, I love seeing the guys and the girls out there on our team and I want to see them do wells too. You know, I think that's a big goal of kind of like construction is, is like taking employees from right now to 10 years from now and having them in a completely different position, growing with the company as well. Oh yeah, for sure. Like, and that's the thing with employees today versus when I started with employees, the, the, there wasn't, we didn't talk culture. We didn't talk anything. You show up, go, go to work, get your paycheck at the end of the week. And that was basically, you know, you want to be in construction. Well then get up and, and get at it and put in lots of hours because that's your life. Today's culture that you're, that we've created with the company, uh, it's so different and it's great to see. And I enjoy coming to work to see everybody and to see the work that they're standing, they're doing and producing to represent Ken White Construction and making us look good with our clients and, you know, 
like that's that's the fun part too and we've got a really good group of uh, guys and girls that go out there and put in an honest hard day work and enjoy coming to work with us and it's awesome to see like it's it's mind-blowing the culture that we have right now I think it's really interesting that like back when you were, you know, 100% running the business, there was no camp days, you know, there was no anything uh, such as that. Now we have, you know, a day at the beginning of the year dedicated to just camp days so that we build like team bonding and morale and culture. And it's a fun time just for everyone to kind of let loose. But that's the intentions of it. What are your thoughts on i guess the more effort and the more cost you know that goes towards that stuff now of of putting in effort for culture and morale do you think that it's needed do you think that it's not needed or what's your opinion on that i think if you want to be a strong business in today's world and grow your business and have good people you got to have those events that we do and you got to you know, show the appreciation back to your employees. Uh, I didn't have to do that before. Like we never did that because that just was not part of the industry. Today, it's becoming much more, uh, I don't, I think it's much more professional, uh, the business of the cultures and inclusive of people in your business to, to grow. And I think it's an, a, a definitely got to get on board or else you're going to be stagnant and you're going to be sitting with mediocre people working with you. So we want the best of the best and we're, we're getting the best and it's, it's nice to see. Yeah. Meteorocracy doesn't have a place uh, in construction, especially at a growing business. Um, do you find it more difficult at the size of business we're at now versus when I just really kind of started getting serious in 2018 about business and we had four employees. I find it more interesting right now uh, because it's control that I don't have. I don't have control of the day-to-day -day operation stuff that right now. Like for instance, uh, my Diane, my wife, she asked me, you know, two days ago, she goes, so what is, what are you doing? Because I was talking about uh, what Brad was like, my pro our project manager was, you know, setting up the jobs and the schedule and doing everything. She goes, well, what do you do now though? You haven't done that for like a year and a half, two years. Yes. Cause mom, she still thought that maybe I was the one coordinating the jobs, meeting the clients, sending the invoices. I don't do that anymore. I said, no, I'm more in the office overseeing everything, but I'm more the the moving stuff around, making sure that the money's coming in, that kind of stuff. So it's been very uh, different for me to be able to step back and, and see that go that way. But I'm enjoying. That's good. That's the main thing. No one has a gun to your head when you say that. <laughs> I'm having fun. Uh, but I guess you were just speaking about where you are now and you know how your roles kind of change and you used to do this and now you're doing that like i know that we have spoken before but what is your you know your your when's retirement when are you not gone do you care to retire do you want to come in and work three days a week do you not are you always going to work are you always not going to be here like what's your plan do you want to be here five days a week 10 hours a day do you not my idea of retirement is basically, I want to be able to come and go as I please uh, with the work. I still want to be able to come and see everybody, be part of it, uh, be more like a mentor uh, on advising, you know, the you guys through stuff. But I don't want to have to be, you know, stuck having to come into to work every day. Do I, uh, you know, it, it, that's, that's, and, and when do I want to do that? I'm probably going to say within the next five years. It, go, it goes up a year every time I talk to you. Yeah. But, but I'll always be doing something. Like, I just can't see myself walking away and not wanting to be, you know, part of the company doing something. Uh, whatever little role that may be, but I'll still be wanting to do something. 
I also think though, it's a part of you, like you, you used to be like, you used to work my hours. Like I'm here before anybody else in the morning at five 30 in the morning. And then, I mean, now with just with this year with Kara and then, you know, my wife being pregnant again as well too. Um, you know, I'm normally out of here at five, five 15, five 30, whatever, but you know, regardless, you know, I'm here 12 hours normally a day, five days a week, and then answering calls and stuff. You used to do that. You don't do that anymore. Now you could come in at 9, 30, 10 o'clock and put in your day and whatever. Um, but I think a lot of it, like what you're saying, though, it's like, you, you're just not ready for that, though, yet. Like when you say five years, you mean five years because... It's not like someone's holding you here like we you need to be here every day. Like you have a role, you have what you do 100%, but that's all stuff that like, you know, you go to your cabin in the winter time and on Thursdays you go golfing and hopefully Fridays you take off this summer and your hours have changed. So you're starting to let go of that process, but someone with a personality such as yourself and that's why I am a workaholic because you raised me to be a workaholic as well too, so it's all your fault. But but I, th that's kind of the plan and you kind of are executing that. Would you not say? Oh yeah, for sure. And, you know, as, as I, things go, I find, you know, I'm not controlling the day-to-day -day stuff, uh, now. And that's when it allows me then to be able to come and go as I please, because I don't, don't have to worry about what's happening out on the job sites. If there's issues, sure, you know, you bring it to my attention as to what has happened. Uh, but yeah, I don't need to be able to do that. And that's my idea of semi-retiring, basically down the road is not having to worry about it. And someone else is worrying about the stuff, but I can still come in and be part of uh, the roundtable meeting if I wanted to. So the only thing that I think you really care about that on like in a mental checklist i'm talking in business is like are we invoicing people what are our receivables and are the checks being put into the bank and does our bank account have enough money in it to survive next month because i guess you know what do we have is there a secret honey pot of money somewhere that we just keep pulling from or i pull from no i have i'm still looking for it do you give me an allowance? Yeah, no, I haven't given you an allowance in a while. Do you just give me everything in life? Well, of course I do. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> no, you work and you do, you, you, you're in it. You're taking it to the next level. And I'm along for the ride, like I said, and I'm enjoying it. Yeah, but it's like I said at the beginning, um, it's a team thing, right? There's not one without the other. And I think that that's really important. I think that when people see social media, that's the part that we forget to convey, not forget. I actually play on it as well, too. I love playing on the third generation silver spoon, you know, all that stuff, but it takes a, a an army, you know, it takes a team to make the, the business grow right now. And that's, you know, as much as my role is kind of outward facing of like, where are we going? Where are we headed? What's next? What's this big thing? What's this big thing? And then marketing as well, too. And I think that it's really important to have, you know, like you said, like, oh, like you're it, you're taking it. But like, I would disagree with that. I would be like, it's both of us. Yeah, no, no, for sure. And I'm, I'm the Debbie Downer guy, right? So I'm, I'm the guy that's saying, whoa, Taylor, it's like, we, we don't need to go do that right now. You're, you're, you know, full of and vinegar and want to just keep rocking and rolling and going. So it's my job to kind of bring back reality a little bit and say, hey, you know what? We could get into some tough times and that's what I just want to gear things to. But that's a, that's a, that's a then problem, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then problem. Yeah. We have a lot of these discussions, people listening in the office all the time, you know, and it's always a joke. And in the winter time, you know, when cash flow is a little bit lower, there's always dad, you know, sitting there at his office trying to figure out like, oh, I got to make it work. We got to make it work. And I'm always just like, come on, like we do this every year. It would be fine. Although we had a great winter this year, right? What do you, like it, this winter was was probably one of the best winters that we actually came out of as far as like 
cash flow and keep not so much cash flow, I guess, because winners always suck. But as far as keeping the guys busy, I think that that was the first one. Like we did the land clearing last year, but two years ago, sorry, but last year we ended up staying busy, like doing home projects and just keeping crews going. Yeah. Like that's what's changed in the business too before. Yeah. You talk about that. You used to shut right down. We'd close doors. I remember that. I remember mid-November. Yeah. We'd, we'd shut down and everybody'd be like, lay me off, lay me off. They'd be laid off and they wouldn't come back till April, May next the following year. Oh, after half loads, May. Yeah. And everybody was good with everybody was good with it. But not now. Like, you know, everyone's got to make a decent living to live in today's world and they want year round work. So yeah, we had a good year last year because I think we're, we're getting set up now that we can work year round. Yeah. Well, that's whole part of my job outward facing is like, I'm already thinking about winter now, you know, and that was the whole point of hiring some of the people we just hired that have sewer and water background. Sewer and water continues on in the winter time, you know, trying to figure out and get into these, you know, the industries within construction that keep busy kind of year round. But yeah, that's a big part. Like we used to completely just close doors, shut her down, do nothing all winter other than plow the storage out. And that's it. And I just did that myself. Like I was the only one working. It was, uh, you know, you, you and you'd still, we'd be in the office every day, obviously, but it's pretty crazy to think of what we used to do compared to if we even thought about doing that now, first of all, we'd lose our workforce. And then second of all, the bank would be knocking, not for a pickup truck this time, but for a building and everything. And like you said, you, you know, I always say like, we've got a monster to feed. I really think that it's important when you talk about like the monster to feed, I know that there's even days today that I go in and you just cannot believe the amount of money that it takes to stay going now versus like what we're doing in two months is what we would have done all year six years ago and 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 now like you see these bills for fuel for insurance for payroll for equipment for maintenance for office supply for everything and you're like hey like it's just i can't some days you literally say that i can't believe how much it's costing us right now like how much it costs just stay going yeah it's a mindset thing like it's it's a huge difference as you grow your business to see the numbers that you got to do when you are uh, growing and getting more employees and, you know, having to pay all the stuff. So to get over that is really hard on the mind to figure go, am I doing the right thing? And the, the thing is too, I find is there's not a lot of people out there that tell you how and what to expect as you're growing the business. Um, like I said, like if somebody wanted to grow their business, I'd love to be able to go, well, here, here's what we went through and here's what you got to do to get there. Uh, but there's no book that tells you exactly how to do it. There's so many curves. Like you said, like, like you've seen it, like we're, we're week after week, we go, okay, we got this figured out. Everything's good. Well, the following week will come up and we'll go, okay, shh. We got to change things here a little bit because the way we're doing it now isn't the way to do it uh, with our, you know, the way we have whatever structured in the business, uh, the way that we're, we're telling, given direction to the employees, all the people out there in the workforce. So that is alone has been a big learning curve for us. And I hope in the future, uh, somebody, you know, wants to know how did you, how do you grow a business? I could tell, we, we could tell them how you have to do that in order to get the business larger. You know, yeah. it's the internal stuff that you don't get told about in the office to have everything flowing properly. And it's tough, right? Doing what we did and growing as we did with no outside capital, uh, a line of credit from the bank sorry bank managers listening but we always want more um you know we didn't there was and no secret honey pot of money sitting somewhere that we could pull from it was your money and a little bit of mine more yours than mine <laughs> and 
you know, big balls. It and bi- exactly, but that's what I mean. I think that's the hardest part of it. All like it comes down to the almighty dollar because. Again, and if you were playing with somebody else's money too, I'm not saying that it's easy because you have somebody else's money. I'm not saying that. All I'm saying is that spreading personally yourself thin is a really big aspect of it. And that's a really big mind F because you're constantly thinking about the almighty dollar and, oh my God, we need this much more this month. We need this much more. Like it's tough doing it all day capital investing in your own self that's why people always ask me like my father-in-law is a you know investor and everyone's like oh like are you investing in rsps and stocks and this i'm like buddy i'm all in on ken white construction and so is my dad that's what we got you want to see my retirement put the drone up in the air and look at the 10 acres of land with iron everywhere that's my retirement yeah that's and that's what i've always said i i tried the you know, investments and RSP stuff uh, on, you know, with other companies. Your business just needs money. I had to cash out on that. And it's like, no, if I can't touch it, can't feel it, I'm not part of it. And so I invest in in ourselves, like, you know, throughout uh, my life, that's all I've been doing is just investing in ourselves. So investing in yourself. Yeah, exactly. And, and, you know, I know it's great makes great sense to go out and buy the RS piece, but, but for us, uh, it, I needed that money to, you know, put back into the company to, to grow for down the road. And, you know, my RSP, like I say, like my RSP for my dad was, was me, my, whenever I end up buying the company and he, if he had lived on, he was going to, you know, be taken care of. I said, like, I'm going to be responsible that that's the RSP that I invested in and you know like with you you know taking over the company and doing your stuff you know you're gonna all be on the hook for a long time owing me money so that's gonna be a good thing that's my RSP oh you (laughs) think that oh oh yeah no 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 (laughs) I'll get you to sign something when you're all liquored up. I like that. And I want to end on that. Investing in yourself. I think that's great. And I think that that's a really great way to summarize the growth that we've had as well, too. I think it's really important um, to say that as well, too. And I also think that it's really important to highlight, you know, the success of a family business over three generations. It's quite, you know things that you do today can be the success of tomorrow and i think that that's really really exciting to highlight being in a family business working with you every single day um it's just super exciting and obviously thank you for coming on today talk about the business and being as open as you could um because i know that this is kind of out of your wheelhouse but i think that a lot of people if they listen to the full uh, show of this can pull a lot of info from it no, well, they might not make it to the end. They might fall asleep on us. No, I don't think so. I think they're going to want more <laughs> anyways. Maybe next time we'll have to have a scotchy poo or something. But uh, thank you, everybody, for listening to the Con Expo Con Egg podcast brought to you by our amazing friends over at Komatsu. We will catch you guys on the next one. Make sure to listen everywhere that podcasts are available. Give a follow, like, whatever. Tag us on Instagram at Con Expo. Appreciate you. Catch you on the next one.